I want to echo what uh, Susie said. It's good to see all of you, but it's especially good to see the Nellises back with us. We've missed you guys, and we're so glad that you are healthy and, uh, and back with us. And for those of you who are visiting, we are super glad to have... Oh, I think, are the youth... So the kids are dismissed, for sure, right? So elementary kids, you guys have class today, and you can head out with Miss Heather and the youth group. I honestly don't know what's happening with you. I'm not sure. I, I think you're supposed to sit in, but I know you just love that. So I'm not sure if Pastor Chris was going to save you and take you out or what the plan was. So you can just sit there till he comes for you. Pastor Chris, what are we doing with the youth today? Are they in? Oh, yes. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. We have a little adult content today, so it'll be, no, that's just not really. But um, if you're just joining us today, we are studying chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Revelation. We finished the letters to the churches and then we started in chapter four the next week. And I had somebody ask me, oh, you mean we're going to go on and like do the whole the whole book. So everybody loves to look at the letters to the churches. And then chapter four and chapter five are pretty cool around the throne in heaven. And then it all kind of goes uh, downhill from there. So we're in chapter 12 this morning. You can turn there if you'd like to. If you don't have a Bible, you might want one today. So if you raise your hand, somebody will bring you a Bible. Or certainly you could look one up on your phone or do whatever's most convenient for you. But um, uh, we would love you to stay today for, uh, for the Agape Fellowship. We're going to have uh, some ice cream before you head off to lunch. Um, I think Susie said last week that what life's short, eat dessert first. So, yeah, we have no promise of tomorrow, so it's important to eat dessert first. I don't know if that even makes sense. But I, I will tell you that after this morning's chapter, you are going to need some ice cream. So I want to mention, too, that we would love, there are some prayer request cards and uh, some info cards out on the, um, one of the little um, countertops in the foyer out there. Um, we pray for you guys each week as a pastoral staff and the ministry teams. And if you have special ways that you would love to be prayed for, we'd love to know about it. Um, so we're going to pray for you whether you like it or not. But if you have something specific that, uh, that you're seeking the Lord about, um, we'd love to know what that is. And also if you're new or visiting or if you have questions or uh, if you have complaints, we'll let Pastor Chris handle those. But if you have questions or anything, you can uh, put them on an info card. And there's a little box you can drop these things out there. We are here to minister to you. Uh, we just need to know um, what we can do for you. So uh, with all of that foolishness out of the way, let's pray. And just ask the Lord to really bless uh, our time as we look at the word this morning. So Father, we thank you so much. For this morning, Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the privilege, Lord, of gathering together as your people, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, and then as you open your word to us. And so we pray for the teaching ministry of your spirit this morning, Lord. We pray that he alone would be our teacher, Lord. Give us ears to hear what he would say to your church this morning, Lord, those things that he would speak to each one of our hearts personally, Lord, and those things that he wants to say to us as a church collectively, Lord, and, and to the greater body of Christ corporately. And so we thank you, Lord. We, we dedicate this time to you. And we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Revelation chapter 12, um, if you haven't been with us, it's all the way to the right in your Bible, and you'll, uh, you'll find it. But here we are in chapter 12. Remember, we're kind of paused chronologically right at what is the midway point of the coming tribulation. So we're three and a half years into that final seven-year period, or Daniel's 70th week of that prophecy out of Daniel chapter 9. And we've seen the first two sets of three sets of judgment already poured out upon the earth. We've seen the sealed judgments. We've been through the trumpet judgments. And then two weeks ago, we started another one of what are called these sort of parenthetical passages placed right here in the middle of the book, at the middle of the tribulation. Remember, chapters 10 through 14 are these this parentheses that give us some additional information as a background to this period 
of time. Remember chapter 10, we called it the little book with the big message. And it was just a, a declaration right here, heaven assuring us that God will finish his program, right? There will be no more delay, we saw. Last week, we looked at chapter 11. And we saw one more temple, right? The Jews we will rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. And then we saw two godly witnesses, right? God raising up these two powerful prophets, most likely Moses and Elijah, to testify for what will be that first half of the tribulation period. And then after the one more temple and the two godly witnesses, we of course saw the third Woe. And this was the sounding of that seventh trumpet, which we'd been promised previously would bring about the accomplishment of the mystery of God, right? Just the, the fulfilling of so many of those Old Testament passages that relate to the second coming of Jesus and the establishing of his kingdom. So this is really the beginning of the end. Remember, the seventh trumpet introduces... And it includes those seven bold judgments which uh, complete the wrath of God during this time. But before we get to all that, as we move this morning into chapter 12, we're continuing on in kind of this parenthetical passage. And this is a very important section within that section. Because in Revelation chapter 12 and 13, we kind of have this introduction to some of the really key characters in the drama of this tribulation time as a whole. More specifically, the, those that will play a really major role in the action and the events in the last half of the tribulation. And this is exactly why I believe the Holy Spirit places it here, right in the middle of the book, right in the middle of this seven-year period. Now, for us... We're not going to be here for any of this, right? But for us today, what this does, in addition to just helping us understand, because it gives us some very important background to this period, it really gives us, I think, some special insight in how we can navigate our own, you know, kind of trials and tribulations that we endure in this world as believers. And I think we're going to see that the text really details, really encourages us about the, the Lord's protection over us and the, the plan that the Lord has for us as he defeats our greatest enemy for us. And so we're going to start right off in verse 1. These are signs and symbols that are seen in heaven. And these are actually the first of a series of signs that are given to us to signify something else. So the things that John's seeing are not the actual thing, but they signify something else, someone that God is about to reveal. And though these signs we'll see were seen by John in heaven, they all correspond, they point to something that's going to happen on earth. And the first one of those is the sign of the woman. Look at the first two verses of Revelation chapter 12. Where John writes that now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So, since this is a sign in heaven of something or someone that's going to come on the earth, we might first ask, well, who is this woman? And throughout history, there have been uh, no shortage of suggestions. Some of our friends in the Roman Catholic Church want us to believe that this is Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus. And this is why you'll so often see kind of a similar image of the Virgin Mary in artists' renderings, right? You see that sunburst behind her and the, the moon there under her, the, the stars all around her. And that image comes right here from this passage. Now, unfortunately, as we read on in this chapter, we're going to see that the rest of the passage, in particular verse 6, verses 13 through 17 as we get to the end, they kind of make it impossible for this to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. So that makes this interpretation super strained at best. Now, ironically, there's another Mary in church history, 
right? Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, which by the way is neither Christian nor science, but Mary Baker Eddy would like us to believe that she herself is the woman and that Christian Science is the birthed child and that the dragon, which we're gonna see next, that that's the world trying to destroy her new religion. Now I'm trusting we don't have to spend any more time on that suggestion. Others would have us to believe that the woman is the church. And yet this picture gets a little bit twisted up too because the church doesn't give birth to Jesus, right? Jesus gives birth to the church. Now I hope I didn't spoil anything for you. If you haven't read ahead, yes, the child is Jesus, and we're going to see that as we go. So the only contextual, the only theological, and the really scriptural solution to this question is that the woman symbolizes Israel, right? The church is the bride of Christ, and yet both Isaiah and Hosea tell us that Israel is the wife of Jehovah. As we look to the scriptures, what we find out is that the first mention of this kind of imagery of the sun and the moon and the stars, we see it used in Genesis chapter 37 as a symbol, you remember, in that dream that Joseph had, where the sun and the moon refer to Jacob and Rachel, right, Joseph's parents, and the stars to Joseph's 12 brothers, right, the 12 sons of Jacob, who would be the fathers of the nation of Israel. So this image is a picture of the whole family of Israel. Israel. Remember, as we've studied through the book of Revelation so far, the key to understanding these difficult New Testament passages is so often what? It's simply the Old Testament. Because out of 404 verses in the book of Revelation, remember that 278 of those verses contain very clear references back to the Old Testament. That's almost 70% of this book finds its roots right in the Old Testament. So we need the Old Testament to help us understand the New Testament. And we also need the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. So we have this picture of the nation of Israel ready to give birth, right? Ready to bring forth the Messiah during a time of travail and hardship. Look what it says in verse 3, our second sign. It says that another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. If you're visiting, aren't you glad you're here today? Amen. God bless you guys, right? So this fiery red dragon is kind of a curious character. Fortunately, we don't need to look very far searching the scriptures to find out who he is. Rather than thumbing all around the Old Testament, just jump down and look at verse 9. We see this dragon is clearly identified as the devil and Satan, right? But pictured here as this kind of fierce, terrifying dragon. Many people suspect that the color red is just a picture of the, the bloodshed that's going to be characteristic of this period. Or maybe it speaks simply about the appetite that Satan has always had for blood. Jesus said in John 8 that he was a murderer from the beginning. And most likely, this passage might be where people get this idea of Satan somehow always being dressed in red and, and having these horns. I'm not exactly sure where the pitchfork idea comes in, but the, the, at any rate, the, the imagery here of horns and heads and crowns, they're actually pretty important to us because they also appear repeatedly in other places in the Old Testament scripture, and they always represent authority. They represent power. And here, and heads and crowns all point to the incredible power and the authority that Satan is going to command, especially as we move here into this latter part of the tribulation. Right? Remember the number seven signifies what? We've talked about the fact that it signifies it's the number of completion or it represents all of something. And so these seven crowns 
very likely point to the fact that Satan will soon, during this time, he will command all of the power and the authority over all the world. Now, I think it's interesting that the specific mention of the seven heads, which hold the seven crowns, some Bible students see in this a reference to the city from which the Antichrist will someday reign. The city referred to as the, the city of the seven hills, which of course is Rome. Now, interestingly, while the, the seven heads might refer to a geographical place, the ten horns definitely refer to Satan's political base. Because as we look, again, through the Old Testament, we see a strangely similar image. And what we realize is that the ten horns here are the ten toes of the vision that Daniel receives in Daniel chapter 2. Those ten toes which typify ten kings who are each going to rule over ten nations. Right, This ten nation confederation, this final world ruling empire that's going to emerge during the last days, raised from the old Roman Empire at the end of the age just before the return of Jesus and the establishing of his kingdom. Ironically, of course, it's this final ruling empire that looks very much exactly like what we see happening even today in Europe in all of its kind of fluctuating forms. So these are ten kings who in the future will very willingly hand over their power. They're going to give over their authority to the devil, not personally, but through his agent, the Antichrist. And then Satan, of course, will use the Antichrist. He'll use this power to dominate and to rule the world. Now, we're going to talk more about these heads and horns and crowns next week in chapter 13, and then again in chapter 17, where we get really some more details and we kind of get to focus in a little bit more on the beast or the Antichrist. But for now, as we consider this picture of Satan himself, look what we learn in verse 4. Again, we kind of get some insight into how and when Satan got his start. Look where it says that he, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, this is a reference Again, back to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 14. It's the description of Satan's original fall from his previous glory, right? As Lucifer, right? Probably an, another archangel, much like Michael or even Gabriel. Isaiah chapter 14, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. So what we learn from the Bible is that Lucifer was this beautiful sort of chief of all of the created beings in heaven. But when he revolted against the Lord, right, because he was swelled up with pride, and in a, you know, he took some of the other angels or the stars of heaven, he took them down with it. We see this referred to in Job chapter 38. We see it in Jude chapter 6. And here we're told specifically that a third of all of the existing angels followed after the devil in his proud rebellion against God, right? His rebellion against God's authority. And they now are what we think of today as demons. And what I think is really fascinating to consider about demons is that, remember, these were creatures who fully experienced for themselves the very presence of God. They were around the throne of God. Right? We can only sing about being around this throne that one day we will be around as we worship for eternity, worshiping the God who inhabits that throne. So now we do it by faith, but these angelic beings were actually right there. 
They witnessed God in his glory and all of his wisdom and all of his power and all and all and all that he is. And yet the devil was somehow able to convince a third of them to follow him instead into his rebellion. Now just how seductive is that? Just how subtle is that? How conniving is that? So at the very least, Satan is a formidable creature. It was actually Mark Twain who said this. He said, we may not pay Satan reverence, but we can at least respect his talents. A person who has for untold centuries maintained the imposing position of spiritual head of four-fifths of the human race and political head of the whole of it must be granted the possession of executive abilities of the loftiest order. So he is greater, just in terms of raw creation, he is greater than any one of us in this room this morning. He's not greater than what we are in Christ, amen? But never try to assume that you are somehow going to be able to take him on in some sort of intellectual battle in your own strength. You never want to try to take him on in his subtlety apart from the Bible apart from the word of God. Why was it that Jesus, each time he was in temptation, brought by Satan, remember there at the beginning of his public ministry in Matthew chapter four and Mark chapter one and Luke chapter four, when the devil came against him and tempted him three different times, in three different ways, each time that the devil came against Jesus, Jesus responded in the exact same way And he responded always by answering with the word of God. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written. So I will tell you, the only safe way to answer the devil is to know the word of God and to answer all of his temptations with it. Don't ever move from your Bibles, right? The B-I-B-L-E, right? That's the book for me. It's so simple, right? But it's so true, and don't ever forget it. Now, with all of that said, I need to say this too. It's important to understand that if one-third of the good angels followed the devil into his rebellion and became, became bad angels, well, I'm no math genius, but that seems to me to mean that two-thirds of the angels didn't. Two-thirds of the original number of created angels, they stayed faithful to God. And that is bad news for the devil, as we're going to see toward the end of the text. But it's awfully good news for us, isn't it? Because the book of Hebrews tells us specifically that these angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. And that's you and that's me this morning. They are here to minister to us and to help us in so many ways that we probably will have no understanding of until we're there in heaven, right? They're here in our midst even now. So in this revolt, right, Lucifer, which means shining star, (laughs) became Satan, which means the adversary, And he began this mission to thwart the purposes of God and the the people of God. And he has been perfecting his work for thousands and thousands of years. He's bent on the destruction of God's people and he's bent on the destruction of stopping God's plans. Again, look there at the end of verse 4. It says that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Understand, Satan knows the scriptures, doesn't he? And he knows the mission of the Messiah. And so he has tried repeatedly to destroy Jesus. You read through the Old Testament and you see that Satan did everything he could to keep the Savior from being born. right? And then when Jesus was born... Satan tried to kill him. And we see that, of course, in Matthew chapter 2 through that demonic madman Herod 
who remember after he got kind of tipped off by those unwitting wise men that the Savior had just been born, he sent those soldiers into Bethlehem and had every baby boy under two years old mercilessly killed. Of course, we know that during Jesus' earthly life, he was repeatedly attacked by Satan, ending finally at the cross with his death. But of course, Jesus conquered death through the cross. And now ever since his defeat at the cross, Satan has failed to destroy Jesus, but he has continued, even redoubling his efforts, if you will, to destroy the people of God, the Jews. Satan's attempt to annihilate Israel is one of these overriding themes that not only runs through biblical history, but it also runs through secular history as well, doesn't it? Whether we're talking about Cain or Pharaoh or Haman or Herod or Hitler or any of this current host of the enemies of Israel, Satan has, he is relentless to destroy God's people, right? He didn't devour the child of the woman, so now he's trying to devour the woman herself. Because in his thinking, I'm thinking, right, if there's no Israel, if there are no people of God, then there's no one for Jesus to fulfill those promises to, right? If there's no Israel, there's no Jerusalem. There's no place for Jesus to return to and to rule from. So the plan of the dragon is to keep the Messiah Jesus from returning to Israel by trying to annihilate the Jews before that comes. But of course we know, right, we've read the end of the story and we know that Satan is fighting a fight. He just won't win. Because in verse 5 it says that she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now these two little innocent verses, right, as well as the ones that follow, they cover a huge chunk of human history and they can be kind of confusing because they don't necessarily follow a nice neat chronological order. But again, as we look at other biblical texts, we can kind of unlock and understand. In the first half, look at the verses there. In the first half of verse 5, we have the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, right? And we know that that's Jesus, in case you still didn't believe me, because both Micah 5 and Psalm 2 clearly confirm that it will be the Messiah who will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 it says, you are my son, today I have, I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So clearly this child is that coming king. And so we have his birth there in the first half of the verse. The second half of the verse, we have what? His ascension into heaven like we see in Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. So what we understand is that chronologically, we know there's a gap of at least 33 years between the first and the second sentences of verse 5. And then between verses 5 and 6, similarly, between the ascension and this flight of this woman into the wilderness, we have another gap, but this time it's a gap of the entire age of the church. It's a 2,000 plus year gap that we are living in right now. It ends with the rapture of the church, which starts the beginning of the seven year tribulation. So understand what John's giving us here are just kind of markers. They're sort of bookends, if you will, for each of these key characters. So reading this verse, we have to ask, well, why and when does this woman flee? Well, hopefully you know the answer. If not, here it is again. We've seen it. We'll see it again. When the Antichrist, at this middle point in the tribulation, when he enters the Holy of Holies in the rebuilt temple, stops the sacrifices, demands that he himself is worshipped as God, 
right? Remember the abomination of desolation described in Daniel chapter 9, happening here midway through. It's at that point in the tribulation that the great tribulation, right, the second half, spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 24, that's when that really begins, right? Three and a half years or 1,260 days. We're talking about unparalleled hostility breaking loose against the Jews. And this is why in the Olivet Discourse, speaking to the Jews, Jesus said this in Matthew 24. He said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he says, whoever reads, let him understand. He says, then let loose all who are in Judea, oh, pardon me, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to you who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Nor ever shall be. So Jesus says, right, when you see the Antichrist desecrate the temple and declare himself to be God, he says, run for the desert, right? Or the wilderness. Now, wilderness in Israel, this is this region just to the east between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea heading out toward modern-day Jordan. And we learn from this verse that they're going to flee Jerusalem. Those Jews who are in Jerusalem are going to flee and they're going to go right to this place that God has prepared for them. And many believe that this prophetic place in the wilderness is the ancient rock city of Petra, right, which is, sits south of the Dead Sea in what would have been ancient Moab, modern-day Jordan. And Petra is truly an amazing city. As you can see from the pictures, it's entirely carved out of stone and has stood there for centuries and it's been preserved largely because the only entrance is a passageway about 12 feet wide. And in preparation for this, reportedly, a group of Christian business people have stocked the place with food and evangelistic tracts that are written in Hebrew in preparation for this coming day to be able to try to minister to that fleeing remnant of Jews from Jerusalem when the time finally comes. And that time will come chronologically on earth, immediately following something that actually happens in heaven. Look at this, what John sees next, starting in verse 7, this angelic war in heaven. It says that war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So... This all-out, last day's persecution of the Jews by Satan comes as a result of him getting finally booted out of heaven. Now, if you're like me, you might ask, well, why on earth is Satan even in heaven? Right? Because the idea of Satan in heaven is something we can't really easily wrap our minds around. And yet, the first two chapters of the book of Job make it pretty clear that as of now, Satan somehow has access to heaven. You remember it says that, you know, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So Satan seems right now to have this kind of a back and forth thing going on that he does, right? He spends time here messing things up on earth. Then he goes back up to heaven. But again, why would he go back up to heaven 
Well, we're going to see that he has a very specific and a very diabolical purpose. And we're going to see that in the very next verse. So as difficult as it may be to understand, the truth is that despite his rebellion and despite his fall from grace, Satan still has some sort of access to heaven because it serves God's plan in some way. At least until we get halfway through the tribulation, here in these verses, when he'll be cast out. And he gets cast out after this struggle against Michael the archangel. Again, another interesting character, right? One of these high-ranking angels, an archangel, who we see often in the scriptures, in the book of Daniel and in Jude, Michael seems to have a special ministry to the nation of Israel. So there's this battle that is going to occur now. Can you imagine what this battle might be like? Right? Some have suggested maybe it's just some kind of a spiritual battle. Others have suggested that it will somehow take place, in a sense, in the physical realm. And if that's the case, I have to think it's going to be kind of like something from like one of the Avengers movies, right? With these incredible heavenly beings just flinging each other around through the air, right? Until all of these fallen angels, including Satan, have been thrown out of heaven one by one and somehow come crashing down to the earth. And what we do know is that as heaven watches, look what happens in verse 10, it erupts in praise. John says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So finally, for the rest of eternity, Satan is kicked out of heaven and heaven just rejoices over it. And heaven rejoices if nothing else, for the fact that Satan is no longer going to be allowed to engage in what it appears is his primary activity in heaven. And that's that he goes up into heaven to bring accusation before God against you and against me. Right? Verse 10 says he's the accuser of the brethren, accusing them day and night before God. So even now, Right now, this morning, we're sitting in church and Satan is there before the throne making accusations against each one of us, pointing out each fault, pointing out each failure, pointing out every time we fall and fail in our walks. This is what he does. And that word accuser is a really interesting one. It's kati goros. Kati means against Goros means a place of public speaking. So it means to, to, be, to speak against in public. So we get this image in heaven kind of of a, this courtroom, right? Where the father's the judge and you've got the devil coming in kind of like a prosecuting attorney. And he's bringing charges against us before the judge in this tribunal. So John's giving us some amazing insight into what it is that's happening up in heaven even today this morning. And what's happening is that this prosecuting attorney is so convincing, right? So convincing that he was able to get a third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion. And so he takes all of these facts concerning our lives and he goes up there and starts laying out his case against us. How much chance do you think we have, right, of a not guilty verdict? You notice the frequency with which he brings these accusations. It's day and night, right? He never stops doing this. I'll tell you this, if there's one thing we could learn from Satan, it's his work ethic. He is active and he is effective. And the problem with this case that Satan presents before the Father against us is that all of his accusations against all of us are probably all true, aren't they? I certainly wish 
that I never sinned, right? I certainly wish that I was perfect. One day, of course, we will be perfected. But at this point, each and every day, I fall so short and I give Satan so much ammunition for these accusations and for this condemnation that he's trying to bring against me. And he is as slick a prosecuting attorney as you could ever hope to find. He has this airtight case against each one of us. And keep in mind, he's bringing it before a judge who must judge righteously. So what possible hope is there at all for any of us at all? And of course, there is hope, right? And it's in verse 11. It says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So our text tells us that we overcome these constant accusations right, by this slick accuser with three things. Right? The blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives to the death. I want you to underline that verse in your Bible, but I only want you to underline it if you're interested in spiritual victory. If you're not, then by all means do not, do not underline it at all. So how is the devil overcome? Well, it's certainly not by us trying to do battle against him. First and foremost, it's by the blood of the lamb. Right? By the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God shed for us on the cross of Calvary. We've talked before about the fact that the Bible says the life is in the blood. And so whenever we read about the blood of Jesus Christ, right, that represents his life given for our life. Right, given for the forgiveness of our sins. And so what happens in this heavenly courtroom, you've got the judge, right? This wonderful, righteous judge. You've got this prosecuting attorney with this absolutely airtight case, right? But because of our faith in Jesus, Jesus himself becomes our defense attorney. It says in Hebrews 7 that he always lives to make intercession for us. So when those accusations are hurled against us, he comes into that same courtroom and he is able to wipe out every one of those accusations the only way that they can be wiped out. And that's by his blood and our faith in his sacrifice. In 1 John 1, it says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His son cleanses us from all sin. It cleanses us. So maybe just pause, take a moment this morning and enjoy that word cleanses. Right? Satan is a defeated enemy because of our faith in Christ, right? Any of these accusations against us, they have no traction in heaven because of Jesus and because we're in, in him. The only hope, the only hope that Satan has is if he can get us to believe that we're condemned. Then we condemn ourselves, right? Because Satan knows that God doesn't condemn us. And this is important, right? What happens every day in heaven Right, These accusations, that's taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ. But that same thing happens every day here on earth, and the results are often tragic. It's those times when Satan relentlessly whispers his lies in our ears. Those lies where he says, you know, you're not worthy to be blessed. You're not good enough to be used. This time you've really gone too far. You've crossed the line. You've overstepped God's grace. But Satan's words are all just lies. God's words are what are true. God's words are what don't change in spite of our feelings, right? So often our feelings are just plain wrong. And so we really need to understand the difference between condemnation, which always comes from Satan, and conviction, which only comes from the Holy Spirit. Understand that the condemning work of Satan 
will always push us further away from God, thinking that we've somehow worn out his grace and we're not good enough anymore. But that conviction of the Holy Spirit, when we have sinned, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will always draw us closer to God because it's driving us to the foot of the cross. It gives us that desire for restoration and that confidence that we know that God wants to do that for us. So again, the condemnation of Satan is always about not measuring up, but that conviction that the Spirit can bring is always about forgiveness. It's always about going on. It's always about seeking God's glory and looking for his grace. And so the next time you are feeling condemned and being accused by the accuser, just look at how far the Lord has brought you. Right? Look at your own testimony for a reminder of God's grace as it works in your life. Because again, we see in this very same verse, this is yet another one of the ways that we defeat Satan. It's by the word of our testimony. And that's not just the wonderful story of how we were first saved when we were rescued by the Lord, but it's the continuing story of the way that the Lord is bringing us along in our new lives in him. So do we fail? Yes. Do we fall? Yes. But are we the same person that we once were? Absolutely not. And that in and of itself is such a powerful reality. That's the word of our testimony. Remember as we went through the book of Acts, on multiple occasions, the way that the apostle Paul got dragged before these kind of impressive assemblies of these powerful people and he was going to give his defense of his faith in Jesus and the reality of the, the risen Christ. And remember each and every time, instead of presenting some kind of intellectual masterpiece or a, a theological treatise, you know, given by what even secular scholars believe was arguably one of the greatest minds in all of human history, right? But instead of doing any of that, Paul shared his own personal testimony. Paul shared with them who he was before he met Jesus and what happened when he did meet Jesus. He shared with them who he is now after meeting Jesus. And it was powerful and usually left people speechless, just in the very same way it's powerful when you share your testimony with others, especially if they knew you before and they marvel at who you are today. But here's what I want to encourage you with, is that for us in our lives, just as powerful it is when we tell our testimony to others, and they marvel at God's grace and they marvel at what God's done to save us. They marvel at the things that God has done in us. We sometimes need to tell ourselves our own testimony so that we can be reminded of how wonderful God is in his grace. And we can be reminded of how powerful he is and the way that he rescued us out of our sin. And we can be reminded of the way he has preserved us and the way that he has sustained us every minute of every day, year after year perhaps, in and out of every situation. That's what our testimony tells us. Sometimes I call that rehearsing God's faithfulness in your life. And it is such a powerful way to be reminded and to overcome the enemy at that point when he starts to come in with that condemnation, right? It boosts our own faith for our own future, right? That we belong to the Lord. He's doing a work in our lives. And what possibly can our enemy or any man do to us? Which, by the way, is the third way that we see here that we can overcome the enemy it says they did not love their lives to the death. Right? Overcoming the devil involves commitment to the Lord at all costs. Right? Despite the consequences because of our faith. When we get to that point where we can say, even my life is not most important to me, but it's my testimony to him. It's my faithfulness to him. It takes a whole lot out of the hands of the devil when we can get to that point. 
what do you do with a person like that? Right? A person who won't even compromise to save their life. And to be able to get to the point where we can truly live like that is to live with a sense of freedom that very few people ever really know. To live with that kind of absolute confidence in the Lord. It's precisely what Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 16 where he said that whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Right? It's as we die to ourselves, and we're, we're less concerned about our own lives and our own plan and our own comfort. And we're more concerned about that life of Jesus just coming out of us. Right? As we start to let go to those things that we can't control, but instead we just continue to trust in, in God who holds and controls everything. It's where we give up seeking the things that we think are good, but instead we seek to serve others and bring glory to God. That's when we're at that point where we will be able to overcome all of the fiery darts of the animal, uh, the animal, fiery darts of the animals. There's animals shooting fiery darts. That doesn't even make any sense. The fiery darts of the devil, right? and the wiles of the devil, all of those accusations and the condemnation. He's a defeated foe, right? He's defeated at the cross. He's going to be cast out of heaven. Verse 12 says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Right? So there's this joy in heaven, but there is going to be woe on earth. Because from this time in our text, Satan's time is short and he knows it. Just three and a half years from this point, and he's about to be cast in Revelation 20 into the bottomless pit. So for three and a half years, he's going to do everything he can. And following that war in heaven is this resulting wrath on earth. Verse 13 says that when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of of the serpent. So the great dragon comes down in great wrath. Right? No longer can he stay up there accusing the brethren before the father. So now he's going to turn up the heat and persecute them on the earth. The, the liar becomes the lion. And now here he is on earth very much seeking whom he may devour and focusing his attacks on Israel. But look what it says there. It says that God's going to protect the Jewish remnant. He says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now remember, and I'm going to do this as quickly, when God led Israel out of Egypt, in Exodus chapter 19, it tells us that it was on eagles' wings. If you look in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that God cares for them in the wilderness the way that an eagle would care for her babies. And so the idea scripturally here is not necessarily like literal eagles carrying them out to the wilderness. And it's not even as some would surmise necessarily that somehow the eagle, the, U the United States, is somehow going to airlift the Jews to safety. I don't even know if the United States is going to be around at this point. Probably not at the rate we're going. But the point is here that the Lord himself is supernaturally enabling his people in their escape. Right? He's taking his believing remnant to that special place, taking them out there probably to Petra. Wherever it is, it is surely a place that Satan can't penetrate. And God is going to preserve them there for a time, times, and half a time. This is language right out of the book of Daniel. Three and a half years, right? The great tribulation. A time is one year. Times is two years. So now we're up to three and another half time, that's three and a half. We see that Satan doesn't give up easily, right? Here go the Jews fleeing out there to this safe haven. Look at verse 15. So the serpent 
spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. So Satan uses this water like a flood, again, to try to exterminate these Jews, right? Now, this is probably symbolizing a great army, many believe, sent at the command, right? Spewed out of the mouth, if you will, of the Antichrist. It could be a literal flood, right? But again, more likely an army that sent out pursuing them, chasing after them, if you will, like a flood. But notice what happens in verse 16. It says that the army won't be successful because the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. How about that for a visual? It sounds to me like we're back in the Old Testament, doesn't it? Again, where have we seen this before? Well, right out of Numbers chapter 16. An account literally of the earth opening up and devouring people, right? Remember that rebellion against Moses? The ground opening up under the feet of Korah and Datham and Abiram and swallowing up not only them, but all of their families and their possessions, some of their friends, right? And remember another example, it wasn't just a few families and tents and camels. In Exodus chapter 14, of course, God swallowed up the entire army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea, just as they were pursuing after God's people. And he will just as easily swallow up this army of the Antichrist as they, again, are pursuing God's people fleeing to the wilderness. So the Antichrist will be stalled at this point in his attempt to decimate the Jews. And it says in verse 17 that after the dragon, oh, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God assists the Israelites, right? So that they're not completely destroyed and Satan, right, he knows he can't touch them. So in this final frustrated rage, he turns his attention and now he's going to persecute all of the rest of the Jewish people. Again, this is during the tribulation. There are no more Christians, right? There are only Jews who believe now in the Messiah. But any of them, he's going to find them and persecute them because of their faith in Jesus. 11, 17, not too bad. Listen, if you feel like your head is spinning a little bit, you're not alone, right? There is a lot to take in here. And some of it's hard to digest, isn't it? And most likely, probably what you need is just some ice cream. <laughs> so make sure, I, there's nothing that ice cream can't fix. What we need to remember from our text today is our enemy is absolutely a powerful one, but he is also a defeated one, right? We just read the end of the book, right? We know how this ends. We can't lose sight of that. A.W. Tozer wrote this. He says, I'm not afraid of the devil. He says, the devil can't handle me. He's got judo I never heard of but he can't handle the one to whom I'm joined. He can't handle the one to whom I'm united. He can't handle the one whose nature dwells in my nature. And God has given us all that we need to continue to overcome him. Right? He's given us the blood of the lamb and we have the word of our testimony. Right, Living for Jesus instead of living for ourselves. And I can't think of a better day to be able to finish the service celebrating communion. Because all of those things, of course, are wrapped up in this wonderful thing that we get to do as we remember Jesus, we remember his sacrifice on our behalf. We look back, perhaps rehearsing God's faithfulness even as we take the elements remembering the things that he's done for us in the past and the way that he's brought us through these situations where we were convinced we were done, right? 
But God brought us through somehow. And he'll continue to do that until he accomplishes all of his purposes through each and every one of us this morning. That's what we remember as we take communion. So communion here at Calvary Chapel, it's open to any believer in Jesus. We don't need your church membership letters or your ID card. Does everybody bring their Christian ID card this morning? Because I didn't bring mine. We don't need to see that. It's between you and the Lord. If you're a believer in Jesus, we want you to take communion. If you need prayer for something before you take communion, there'll be people up here to my right and to my left, and they would love to pray with you and to pray for you and to help you so that you can come to the communion table sort of with a clean slate and a clear conscience. So as the kids... Most of them are my kids, but as the, the tall ones aren't mine. So somebody got that. Yeah. Justin, did you get that? Yeah. As they minister in music, just feel free to come up to the table, take the communion elements back to your seat, and take them whenever you'd like to take them, between you and the Lord when you're ready. And then um, after we take in communion, we can um, stand for the remainder of the song worship the Lord. So Father, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord, and we thank you for your word, Lord, even the difficult parts, Lord, the puzzling parts like we looked at this morning. Lord, we thank you for the great encouragement that comes to us from it. And so we thank you for the assurance, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity today to look back at the cross, Lord, as we celebrate communion, Lord, and as we look ahead to all of these promises that are yet to be fulfilled, Lord, but we know they are as good as fulfilled because that you made them. And so, Lord, I pray as we go to this time of communion, Lord, that you would make it special, Lord, that you'd do a deep work in each one of our hearts. Lord, bless this time, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's just worship the Lord.